Welcome to Newly Invested, the podcast that's all about the real, sometimes raw journey of real estate investing. I'm your host, Judith Tate, bringing you conversations from the trenches of the investment landscape where we celebrate victories, learn from setbacks, and unlock the secrets to successful property investing. Whether you're a novice investor seeking tips and guidance or a seasoned pro eager to share your story, you've come to the right place. Let's get started and delve into the exciting world of real estate investing. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Newly Invested. I'm your host, Judith Tate. And today we are joined by my dear friend, Gretchen Casey. Hi, Gretchen. Hi, Judy. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. Great. How are you? I'm great. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I can't wait to hear what you have to share with my audience today. Uh, So I'll just do a quick intro. So Gretchen is your trusted guide in the complex world of real estate financing. As a seasoned mortgage agent with more than 19 years of experience, she possesses the knowledge, expertise, and dedication to help you navigate the often perplexing mortgage landscape confidently. Repeat clients are the number one source of business for mortgages by Gretchen, also known as MBG, with realtors being number two. Combining extensive market insights, a keen understanding of financial intricacies, and a commitment to personalized service, the MBG team can provide exceptional support for home buyers and homeowners at every step of their journey. The experienced support staff at MBG ensures customers and other partners know what to expect throughout the process. Don't wait, connect with Mortgages by Gretchen today and let them be the key to unlocking the doors of your dream home and investment properties. Welcome, Gretchen. Thank you so much. And you know that, so that part of your intro right there where it says the experienced support staff at MBG ensures customers and other partners know what to expect throughout the process. I can personally attest to that. I you like I've been working with you for oh gosh I don't know how many years for a long time now and I always tell everyone it's like oh you got to go to my friend Gretchen if you're looking for mortgages or any type of solutions Gretchen is the person like she's your go-to um you've always been so just amazing with the whole process because it can be very stressful when you're looking at when you're getting a new house or you're getting a new mortgage like renewing there's so much that uh that's required um uh, even just like documentation it's like what do i need and you're so you're so good at you know ensuring that it's just a smooth process it's yeah and every single time like i renew with you or get a new house like it's just always it just gets easier and easier so yeah. well thank you i do care a lot and and do know even my own experience how it's very different when you're on it's your own mortgage and i know it uh, can be challenging so it feels good to hear that you've had good experiences I appreciate that yeah for sure all right so tell us a bit about your just your investing journey or you can even share a bit about like your your clients and their investment journey so whatever it is that you'd like to start with tell us all about it yeah so um my investment journey isn't as um vast as many of my clients um I personally have had a flip property and did that with um, my, at the time, it was my, my partner and uh, another investor who was a contractor. So we had that experience with a property in Oshawa, um, as well as um, renting out in my own space, uh, my own home. Um, I deal with clients from buying their first rental property uh, to buying their fourth, to buying um multifamily, so a full range. And I specialized in investor mortgages for about six years. Um, And it is different um, in a number of ways in qualifying for the mortgage, um, the option of buying in a personal name or a holding company. So um, I find it's fun because it's something different on top of just um, the non-investor. But I personally, I feel like anyone who buys a home is an investor. Even if you don't plan on renting a fortune out or you're, you know, it, it is an investment. It's probably the biggest investment for most people that you will have. So, 
Yeah. And you know what? I, I agree. Um, if you're buying a property, it's an investment. So there's still a lot of, um, well, like doing your due diligence and just knowing what you want, where you want to live. Like there's so many different things that you have to take into consideration. So for someone who is looking to get into buying their first property, whether it be for their own or an investment property, what would be your, um, the most significant due diligence step that you would, or tip that you would give them? One tip. Um, okay. Well, I would say too, if somebody, yeah, sure. first of all, if, if you want to buy as an investment, you need at least 20% down payment. So that's something to consider. And if you are buying, but you, if you have ideas of down the line that you really want to buy multiple properties, it's good to, Think about that up front and let your mortgage agent or whoever, if they don't ask you, which they should, but they don't ask you, let them know that so that you start off with that in mind right from the start. So that would, is what I would say if someone is thinking, you know, I think most of your audience thinks maybe they are going to be longer term investors. So I'd say that just bring that out up front. And even, even if your second property might not be for a long time, plan that way from the start and discuss things like, you know, what kind of mortgage is best if I'm going to buy a rental and maybe take equity out of this property for my next down payment. So. Yeah, that's a, actually a really good point. Um, and when I started my whole, you know, investing journey, one of the things I learned about was just having a, a an exit strategy, knowing what you're going to do with that property. You don't just buy something for the sake of buying. You actually have to know what you're going to do with it. And I thought, oh, that makes a huge difference. And I think it makes a difference because then uh, it could make a difference in how much you're willing to invest or how much you're willing to spend on that, that property and the type of property you're going to buy and where you're going to buy it. So that's actually a really good point. And I would say as well, it also depends on where you are in your life. So it's going to be different if you're at the building stage, you're fairly young, your, you know, your income, maybe you're going to keep a full-time job. Investing isn't going to be your full-time job, at least to start. So you're in a different phase than maybe the middle part of your life versus later in your life. So it all, those are really important factors. And, and it might be like, you might decide maybe if you're older, you might decide instead of, you might not want to buy an investment, you might want to lend your money in private mortgages, a more hands-off approach. So hmm. um, those are all important factors too. I love it. So what would be your words of advice to say someone who like they figure, okay, I'm going to get a house or I plan on buying a house in like another two years. How do they prepare themselves to get to that point? I would say what I do with people is meet with me and we will treat you as if you're going to buy in the next year, even if you're not, we're going to make some hypothetical guesses on where your situation is going to be. And I share my screen. Usually people nowadays, it's on, on the screen. So I share my screen and we actually look at the application document itself because really a big factor is debt ratios. So in order to see, okay, well, what if your income went up by 10,000? How much will your debt ratios go down and allow you to buy a bigger property perhaps? So mm -hmm. they usually kind of see the impact of different things. Or what if you now have this student loan, but you're going to have it paid off in a year let's show that debt as paid. And again, how does that affect the debt ratios so that you could potentially buy more? Or, you know, maybe you don't even realize how much you need for a down payment. Let's discuss that. So you know what to build towards and where can that money come from? Let's talk about options of where to get your down payment from. So just to kind of treat it as if you're doing it soon and mm. talk about those aspects, you're mainly looking at, you know, income, debts, debt ratios, credit, uh, down payment, and then property type, I would say those are the things and we can kind of work through each step to kind of get them familiar because the first time it might be a bit overwhelming to talk about all those things, but then, you know, can talk multiple times through the process and it'll get more comfortable after a while. Yeah. Oh, I know it's over. I still find it overwhelming. That's why I'm just so grateful to have, you know, you and your team. <laughs> You can just just tell me what I need <laughs> because when I have to look at everything, it's like, oh my gosh, it's it's a lot. So, what different types of mortgages do you do? 
Um, well, so being a broker, we can work with any type of lender. So that means when we say lenders, so like you have what we call the A lenders. So that's like banks, credit unions, um, they're offering best rates. And so if you qualify with those types of lenders, that's awesome because you're going to save money. They're going to have lower rates. Then we have what I call the B lenders. So those are the ones that you don't quite qualify with the A side. Maybe your debt ratio is too high or your credit's not good enough. We can go to those lenders. Then we have mortgage investment companies and private. So those are the ones where if you, you either you don't qualify with the others or you want to maybe you just want short term money, maybe you're going to get inheritance or maybe you're going to fix it up and refi. You're going to, you're going to do the Burr strategy, which we could talk about. So um, I work with all these types of lenders as a mortgage broker. Um, and then I recommend different products based on somebody's goals. What I mean by that is, so maybe you're, you're going to pull equity out of the property in a couple of years because you're going to renovate it. So you, we would consider maybe we want to do a product that has multiple parts and maybe a line of credit as well. So we can um, easily let you borrow later without having to redo the whole thing. So, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. So there's so many different types. Yeah. Okay. And we talked about, you know, fixed versus variable. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, great. Now you mentioned the Burr strategy. So yeah, tell us what yeah. that's about. What does that mean? Well, Burr is buy, re renovate, usually, um, yeah. refinance, rent, and then rinse and repeat, it's meaning that yeah. you, could, you could continually do that with property. So maybe you buy one, you do that whole process, you pull up, what I pull out more equity, which means you, you refinance, mean you add either, either increase the mortgage or add a new mortgage. So now you have a down payment for a next property. Some people, so some people who want to buy multiple properties kind of do that, get mm -hmm. some equity out soon, or they might do a conversion, meaning they take a single family home and they turn it into a duplex or a single family turn it into a triplex. And again, that will have a lot more value. It will have more rental income. And now you can qualify to take out equity, get a new mortgage to buy another property for the down payment. That's great. Yeah, now, so is that to save some... up the down payment? You can actually by building equity in a property, that's how you can get the down payment. Mm, okay. And how many times can you do that? Because I was thinking like, there's got to be a point where you kind of run out of money or you don't qualify anymore because now you have like five houses or something. <laughs> so yes. So if you get to the point where you're not qualifying yeah, um, on the regular residential financing, you can do... Um, commercial financing, which is different, which is really based on the coverage ratio of that specific property, yeah. not your whole portfolio. It's really looking at that property. So commercial financing, you can do joint venture partnerships with other people where you're either helping qualify for the mortgage. Maybe you're going to do some actual work if you're a contractor, or maybe you're going to supply the down payment. So you work with other people or you switch to lenders that will do like a whole portfolio management of mortgages. So some of them, sometimes like if they get to that stage, I may or may not actually work with them. I may say, oh, I have a partner at a specific bank or or I'm going to do a commercial mortgage for you. So, but yes, wow. there is a point where you're not going to necessarily qualify for the normal financing anymore. Okay. And would you suggest that people, um, like if they're doing this as a business, um, open up a corporation right away or wait till they have like a, a few properties under their belts? What does that look like to you? I would say consider doing it right away. Talk to an accountant and talk to a, a real estate lawyer and ask their opinion um, because I, I'm i not either of those things. So you mm -hmm. would one of the benefits of doing it in a, what they call a holding company. So it's like a numbered company to hold real estate um, is liability. So you aren't personally liable if there's a property owned in your corporation. So somebody, mm -hmm. your tenant couldn't, they could sue the corporation, but they can't sue you personally. So that's a good thing. And taxation, sometimes it's better tax wise and yeah. state planning as well. So I would um, say consider it if you, if you already know from the start, like let's say it's, it's not the property you're going to live in. You can't, you, you would do it on the property you're going to live in, but if you're not going to live in it, 
I'd say consider it and talk to those people. And then we also discuss it. I have a client right now. He rents and he's buying a rental property and a holding company in Alberta. He rents in Barrie. Oh. And oh. Because he's been educated, he attends a lot of different events online, listens to people like you, and said, yeah. oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. Oh, okay. So he's, like, his primary residence is a rental? Like, he rents someone else's prop. Oh, and he purchased a West. Yes. Oh, okay. That's actually brilliant. Yes, and the benefit, too, of that for him is to buy and bury it would cost him, to be honest, I don't know exactly, because I'm not in Barry, but say it's 700000 600000 uh -huh. This property is a condo for 160000 Wow. And he's wow. got a buddy out there. It's going to do property management for him at 5% of the rent. So it's a great way for people, if they can't afford Toronto or, you know, more expensive areas to get in the market. Yeah. That's actually really good. There's, I find that uh, there's a lot of people investing like in Calgary and Edmonton um, for various reasons, like properties cash flow better. Plus, it's a little more landlord friendly out there compared to here in Ontario, where it's not so landlord friendly. That's a good point, too. Yeah. And well, and I have people buying in the U.S. because of that issue in the U.S., the landlord uh it's more balanced, let's say. Oh, okay. Yeah, I hear Texas is a good spot. That's a good place to invest. A lot of people investing in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So do you do mortgages for the U.S.? Well, I don't what? at the moment. Um, oh, okay. I do have contacts for that. Um, oh, okay. Considered it on and off just because I am American born and I have family oh. there and I have... Um, you know, I'm there all the time and eventually I may buy in California. So I consider it, but no, I'm not licensed in the U.S. right now. Okay. Interesting. Ooh, American. I always forget that. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So I'm what dual. would you say is uh, one of your uh, favorite success stories for either yourself or one of your clients when it comes to like real estate investing? Um. Well, I would say it you know, for clients, just, you know, I'm thinking of one right now. He's, he's buying a, he's buying a cottage to do Airbnb rental. Um, at the mm -hmm. moment, he just has one owner occupied in a, and going to buy the cottage. But at one point he had about five properties. Um, and he's, he's also done uh, private lending. And so, you know, just to see him, you know, he kind of, you know, with the market changes, he decided to sell, but now he's back in. He's got the bug, I call it, because a lot of people, once you start investing, yeah, it's, it's like addictive. Like, oh, I want to keep doing this. And, you know, the cash flow, the excitement, the working with other people who are also investors who have such great energy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that would be an example. I mean, I have another one who he just bought in Welland and um, with a coach house. So a property on the same property that he can rent out. Uh, mm -hmm. and this is his fifth or sixth. I think it's his. Um, and it's just fun to see people do well. And, and you know, sometimes there's up and downs. Like, you know, sometimes you get prob problem tenants, things like that. But yeah, we'll work through these things. Oh, I love it. That's great. Um, so can you share a, a piece of advice that you wish someone had told you before you got into investing and in the world of mortgages? A uh, piece of advice. I, I wish I invested in real estate younger um, yeah. or in multiple properties. Like, I, you know, I, I did get my first property at 24 when I was married and, you know, I wouldn't say when I was married, but, I was married. We bought our property, but had I known now, I would have been much more like, okay, I need, I need to buy some other properties as investments. And it wasn't something my parents did. Like a lot okay. of times people do it because they're also, it's what they do. It's like they've seen their parents or their siblings or their aunts and uncles buy properties. So that's like, they don't even think about it. Whereas that wasn't something commonly done. So yeah, I would, I would have bought properties. Yeah. You know, I, that's actually a really good piece of advice. Um, I remember being young and just watching my grandpa buy properties 
all over. Like he's got properties in on, Ontario and um, I don't know if he has any of the States, but um, he has a, like back home in, in Jamaica. Uh, and I remember as a kid thinking, uh, why does he have all these properties? Like it just, it didn't make any sense to me. And it wasn't anything that was actually talked about in my household. Um, Cause my parents are very much like, you know, you go to school, you get a good education, you get a good job and you live happily ever after, right? Well, not happily ever after, but you know, that, that's what you do, right? It was never like, you know, look at investments and, you know, look at starting a business. And that was, it's weird because that was very much my grandpa. Um, but it's it, like, he didn't really, I don't know if he didn't share that information with my parents or if my parents just weren't interested. But now I see the value because even though he had a really good job, like he was a chartered accountant for a big company, um, it's it's like a, a, a retirement savings plan, having all these properties. Because now my mom is selling off these properties to help care for him because he's elderly and he needs care and he's able to age in place at home because we've got the money or she's got the money to do it because she can sell all these properties that are worth a lot, right? Yeah. So how... How do you think, sorry, that was a really long story, but how do you think that uh, people nowadays, like especially young people, like say in their 20s, how can they get into owning property? Because it's just like a lot of them can't even save a down payment. And it se seems like such a challenge. Well, I think this example I gave of the client who bought in uh, Alberta, he said, mm -hmm. I can't afford this area, so I'll buy somewhere else. I'll buy or you know, in New Brunswick or, and I'll, I'll keep renting. I'll rent. It's he does, you know, some people have the benefit of they can live with their parents. They have a good mm -hmm. relationship and working out, maybe to keep living with the parents, but but make the purchase. You can get gifted funds. So if you have the, the good fortune that you have parents or grandparents who maybe say, we're going to give you a early inheritance, we're going to give you 50000 or 100000 um, that's one way there there's... Um, you know, you can save in your RSPs, your TFSAs, and borrow them without being taxed on that. Um, there is a, so there's this plan you can do. It's a little bit complicated, but basically you get a loan for an RSP. You get the RSP. So you have the loan and you have the RSP. Then you, when your tax time comes, you're going to use the fact that you got the RSP to get hopefully a tax refund. And then when you get your mortgage, you get a cashback mortgage. So the cashback mortgage should pay off that loan that you got for the RSP. So hmm. now you have an RSP that you can use to, for the down payment. Now it's only going to work. You're probably not going to be able to get more than about twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. And the minimum okay. down payment, let well, on an owner-occupied property, the minimum down well, so you can get a, say a duplex. So you, as long as you live in it. You only have to put down 5% of the first $500,000 and 10% hmm. of anything over. So let's say if you bought for 600,000, you need 5% of the 500, so that's 25,000. Plus you need another 10% of the overage. So that's 100,000, so 10,000 more. So 25,000 plus 10 is 35,000. So that's the formula, 5% for the first 500, 10% for the portion over 500,000. That's the minimum down payment. Oh wow! Does that makes sense. See, I've never, yeah, I've never heard, I've never heard of that. And well, that changed. Why... It used to be just five percent. Oh, and, that, and okay. also now, if it's over a million, you have to have twenty percent down. If With the property is valued over a million, property valued over a million, you buy for over a million, you have to have twenty percent. Twenty percent. Oh, okay. And if it's strictly rental that you're not going to live in it, you have to mm -hmm. have twenty percent down. 20%. Okay. Got it. Wow. All these different rules. That's why it's good to have the professionals in your corner. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah. It's like, oh, got to keep track of all these things. Yeah. That's amazing. Great. <laughs> um, okay. What uh, resources would you recommend to someone just starting their real estate investment journey? Okay. Well, definitely meet with a mortgage broker. I would love it if it's me. Yeah, like the benefit of a mortgage broker, banks can have great people as well, but they only know their product versus mm -hmm. mortgage is going to know lots of different products and options. Also, you want to talk to somebody who has experience working with investors because 
if somebody doesn't have experience, they may not know very much about what to tell you or how to work with you and help you prepare. Mm -hmm. Uh, Educate yourself, go to events. Um, You can go to a lot of free events. Um, There's online things constantly that you can find through social media or through people, you know, Um, or you can, it, it doesn't hurt to pay for training. I mean, a lot of, I actually just had a, um, interview i interviewed danielle unsworth this week and she um is an experienced investor but she said for the longest time she didn't want to pay for to be educated and and so she would just only do the free stuff and then after a while she realized she was really missing out and got more comfortable being willing to that she was investing in in it's like a business so Mm -hmm. more willing to to pay for different types of events i know you yourself have experience with yeah um which maybe you want to mention uh, experience specifically with um, like coaching. Yeah. Like coaching groups or coaching. Um... Oh yes, I am. So my first group that I've invested in is uh, a key spire. Um, it's the Scott McGilvery's coaching program and it has been absolutely amazing. And I've always been the type of person who really believes in investing in myself. I I get it. You know, people don't want to spend the money and they try to get all the free stuff. The problem with going to all the free events and trying to get all the free information is the free stuff teaches you the what and the why. It doesn't teach you the how. And that's what you have to pay for, right? That's it you have to invest in. And as long as you do your due diligence and your research, like don't just, you know, go out there and get the the first program you you see or the you know work with the first coach you see like you know sample their work you know try a few different groups and all that uh and then see if you're willing you know if you know can they provide me what i'm looking for um or is this going to be a worthy investment for me right it might not be them it might be someone else but at the end of the day you need to invest in yourself education is not a waste of money um and you also need to just invest in your business as you mentioned like you're running a business you need to invest in your business. Nothing drives me more insane than business owners. And I've, I own a couple of businesses, business owners who just will not spend the money to grow their business. It's like, what are you doing? This is, it's not a game, right? Like, are you in, it's, is this a hobby or is it a business, right? So if it's a hobby, do what you want. If it's a business, invest in yourself, invest in your business. Yeah. And I want to add a few other things that came to my mind. Yeah, Um, for sure. There's some awesome books I could, I can't off the top of my head think of the best ones. I mean, there's Rich Dad Poor Dad, but there's some other really good ones that I could maybe I'll share and you could have available or people can contact me or you for that. Um, Durham REI is an amazing membership group um, uh-huh. held in Durham region. Um, they meet monthly. I'm a member. It's amazing. Um, yeah. And I would also say a good realtor who's investor focused is an amazing resource. And I know you've experienced that. So Yes. Yeah. So um, I actually had Anita on my podcast and uh, Anita Bongers Lewis. She, yeah, (laughs) she is amazing. So I'm looking at, as you know, I'm looking at student rentals in Durham and uh, what you say about uh, working with a realtor who's investor focused, that is, it's so, it's so key. It's so funny because I ran into a buddy of mine at the grocery store the other day and he's a real estate agent and um he like I was telling him what I was doing he's like well why didn't you call me and I said number one I know like so many realtors right but I needed someone who was very um specifically focused in this area and Anita happens to be one that she's done she's had so many like she's had many student rentals and she's just oh she's just been such such a wealth of information and knowledge like I've really enjoyed working with her so yeah, that's super important. And uh, to add to the books, I just finished two books. One is uh, Never Split the Difference. And that's a really good one. Talks about negotiating. You can apply that to any business. And the second one is Who Not How. Another one that you can apply to any business. And that that one is basically about, you know, if you want to grow your business, you look for the who's to grow your business. Not so much asking yourself every day, you know, how do I do this? How do I do that? Because you can drive yourself insane, you get frustrated. And, you know, 
it just, it doesn't work. If you want to grow, you need to involve other people in the growth. And it just talks about letting go of control of, or wanting to control everything. So go get that book. I recommend that to everybody, everyone who okay. owns a business. <laughs> in the notes or text it to me. Text them yeah. <laughs> For sure. All right. So uh, we're going to go through some lightning round questions that we're going to find out just a little bit more about you. Well, they're oh, just fun questions. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> I say that and everyone's just like, oh my gosh. Uh -oh. So they're just for fun. Okay. First question. Don't make me do karaoke and we'll, we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No karaoke, but I like that idea. <laughs> All right. If you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be and why? Oh. That. I don't have an answer off the top of my head. Um, like the first person I thought of was Oprah. I mean, I know she'd, okay. she'd call her a historical figure, but I think she's pretty damn smart. You know what? I really have another person who's also uh, still living, but um, Michael Singer, who um, wrote a book called The Untethered Soul. I'm very much uh, oh, yes. interested in mindset and um, detaching from the mind and all sorts of things. So he would be really cool to talk to too. You know, I agree. I read his books, The Surrender Experience, The Untethered Soul, Living Untethered. Yeah. And there was another one after that. Really, really good. Yeah. And it's all about just, a lot of it's just about, yeah, like mindset and just letting go. Yeah. And surrendering. I'm working on it. Yeah. I'm working on it every day. I've been working on it my whole life. It's it's tough, but yeah, there's less pain and suffering when you just kind of let go. <laughs> okay. Um, if you were given the chance to start a dream project today with unlimited resources, what would it be? Oh, a dream project. Well, probably something related to um, helping people who struggle with mental health, hmm. whether it be addiction or depression, those sorts of things, because I've been impacted by that a lot with people in my life. So yeah. it really um, is important to me. So something along those lines. That's good. I love it. All right. And can you share a surprising fact about yourself that most people don't know? Oh, well, one thing was being American, because most people do get yeah. surprised when they hear that. And then I go there a lot. And um, another surprising fact. Well, I am a natural redhead. That would be a, a fact. Some people don't ask me, are you really a redhead? So, yes, I'm really? a redhead. And uh, <laughs> what else? Well, I was a little bit of a tomboy as a kid. I have three brothers. So... Um, I had to be right in there with them playing sports, running around the neighborhood and, you know, just, just being rough and tough and out there. So that would be something else that maybe people yeah. wouldn't know that. No, I, I don't. Yeah. I don't picture you as like, you know, growing up like a tomboy. Yeah. No, that's yeah. perfect. <laughs> Good. I love it. All right. So how can people find you or connect with you? Well, so my email is Gretchen at mortgagesbygretchen.com. Um, my website, if you go to Mortgages by Gretchen, you'll find me. Uh, Mortgages.by.gretchen on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, by my name. Um, yeah, I guess that kind of hits it all. Yeah, perfect. And of course, I'll put that all in the show notes as well. Just in case people still use the telephone, 905 570 <laughs> Four one two. That's funny. Anything going on in your business that you want to share, or anything you want to offer our listeners? Oh, gee, I would. Um, well, I'm creating some good infographic sort of information things about the mortgage process and also how to build your down payment. So, if Ooh. anybody's interested in getting those uh, PDF documents, I'd be happy to share those. And yeah, um, yeah I'm going to have a customer appreciation event coming up March 3rd. I'm very excited about that. Oh. Um, Yay. so if anyone listening is a customer of mine, we'd love to love to have it. And um yeah, I guess 
that would be it for the moment. Perfect. That's great. Thank you so much, Gretchen, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's been really fun. You're great. It has been. Aw, thanks. <laughs> and thanks to everyone for watching. We will see you next time on another episode of Newly Invested. Happy investing. Bye. And that brings us to the end of another enlightening episode of Newly Invested. A huge thank you to our guest and to all of you for tuning in. Remember that investing in real estate is a journey filled with highs and lows, but the key is to keep learning, keep investing, and keep growing. If you want to stay updated with our latest episodes, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you enjoyed today's episode, we'd appreciate it if you could leave us a review. This is your host, Judith Tate, signing off, and we'll see you next time on another episode of Newly Invested. Happy investing! The views and opinions expressed are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the podcast. The information shared in the podcast is for general informational purposes only and should not be considered legal, financial, or professional advice.